Thanks for joining us and welcome back to the Watchman on the Wall podcast. Periodically, we'll bring you true stories of angelic encounters, heavenly visitations, near-death experiences, as well as modern-day prophecies that are relevant to us today. When we come back, we'll begin our next episode. Hello again, and welcome back to our podcast. Today we have a very uplifting and positive message about the near-death experience of Heidi Barr. I came across an interview that she did on the internet and found it very fascinating and, and has a very positive message. Heidi had a very tough family life. As a Jewish teenager, everything was going wrong until she died and met Jesus. Here now is part one of the near-death experience of Heidi Barr. Hey friends, we have a very special guest today with a topic that is on the hearts and minds of every single person in the world at some point in their life. Death. Some look at death as a part of life. Others the inevitable they'd rather not think about. And some are actually haunted by the thought their entire life. Our guest today, Heidi Barr, is a hospice nurse and author, and is also a Jewish believer in Jesus. Today, she's going to be sharing with us about her personal experience of death and what brought her to faith in Jesus. Hold on to your seats. It's going to be good. Hey, Heidi, it's so great having you here. Hi, Jeff. It's nice to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited. So I I just want to jump right in. So as a Jewish woman, what was your childhood and family life like, and, and how did you as a Jewish woman come to put your faith in Jesus? I was a Jewish kid, and as a Jewish kid, uh, I was raised in an Orthodox community. It was a uh, relatively small Orthodox community of about 150 families in Iowa. It was strict Orthodox. We had separation of men and women. Women were upstairs balcony behind a curtain. I loved it. We didn't have we didn't have pews. We had davening benches. Kids got to run all over. Everything was kosher. The ark was in the middle of the room downstairs. Um, I loved the traditions. I loved being Jewish. It was really fun. I loved Simchat Torah. I loved Purim. I loved Pesach. I have loved every single Jewish festival, and I loved being part of that Orthodox community. And it never struck me as odd that the women were upstairs. In fact, I think the women preferred being upstairs in a balcony behind a curtain. Um, but I was raised in a family that was atheist. So here we were belonging to this Orthodox synagogue. And my father was not only an atheist, we were only allowed to discuss God in our home if we were denying his existence. Really? He hated God. And I assume maybe he had some sort of concept of God because he hated him. But he used to say, uh, this was kind of a mantra that was repeated from the time I was a small child and it was repeated daily. There is no God, there is no heaven, there is no hell. Um, You are an accident of science. You are less, your life has less significance than the tiniest, most microscopic speck of dust in the universe. Mm. Um, he, He said Christians are weak, they need a crutch, and they, they, fool themselves. I, but I did love being Jewish, except that I had this weird dichotomy. I had this, this weird separation that I was dealing with. From the time I was a very small child, I believed in God. I don't know why I believed in God. I believed in God, the God of Abraham, always. And my dad did not. My mom did not. My mom, I say in my hospice book, my mom set a mean Passover table but she had no concept of God and she could not discuss religion if her life depended upon it. And yet I prayed, she actually called me her little nun. I prayed to God every single night. I talked to God every single night. So this was a a really difficult year for me, which kind of set off this spiral of not talking to God, getting into drugs, Mm. getting into a really difficult 
dangerous situations until I was 15. When I was 15, my life was pretty bad. And I reached a point where um, December of my 15th year, I actually prayed to God. I hadn't talked to God in four years or three years. I prayed to God that he would kill me. I prayed for death. You know how you we say the Shema? Mm -hmm. I prayed with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my spirit, with all my power, that I would die, that God would, would kill me. He didn't kill me then. He killed me three months later. <laughs> so, you know, be careful what you pray for, because you might just get it. I had always loved horses. And when I was uh, 14, my dad took a horse in trade from, he did some legal work for someone, it, the guy happened to own a ranch and he owned a boarding stable. So he, instead of paying my dad, he traded him a horse. Now, all I had was the horse and a hackmore, which is kind of like a bit, kind of like a bridle. I loved my horse. She was young, she was fast. I have always loved horses. I'd been horseback riding camp every summer since I was eight. Mm. I loved horses. And I took my sisters out to the ranch in our big Oldsmobile, green Oldsmobile Delta 88. And um, I was riding alone that day. I had a friend who had a horse also, but she couldn't come that day. She had a cold. So I was just riding by myself. It didn't really matter to me. And uh, I took off, went out into the hills on Heather bareback. I was gone for about an hour. And when I, I thought, oh, my sisters are probably getting bored. I should go back. So when I came back, I didn't want to get off the horse yet. So I, I moved off the trail onto this side trail and just, I was sitting there. I was sitting there just enjoying the day. I had a nice view in all directions and I was uh, very relaxed, just enjoying the day when I suddenly heard hoofbeats and I knew exactly what that meant. That meant that man had won the argument. He had taken out the Arab, the Arabian and, um, she she was out of control mm. so i had nowhere to go i was kind of backed into a corner i had no way off this trail where i was and i thought all right i'm out of the way the horse will run back to the barn because that's generally what horses do the horse just ran right by us kind of almost clipped us may have clipped us i actually wasn't looking back and ran past and heather reared up the first time she reared up, I dropped the reins and grabbed her mane. And I just basically put my arms around her neck. Second time she reared up, her back feet stepped off the trail and she flipped over backwards mm. onto me. She fell across my body, um, fracturing my pelvis, breaking my back. Neither of those were fatal injuries. They were bad, but they weren't fatal. And falling across my chest, crushing my chest. The moment she hit my chest. I left my body. And I found myself up in the air, looking down. 30, 40 feet up in the air. I was still me. I watched my horse roll over my dead body. And I was tossed like a rag doll. I didn't care. My body meant nothing to me. Nothing. I knew I was dead. I saw, I could see everything in front of me. And I should not have been able to see anything, but I could see everything. I saw my little sister scream and, and cover her eyes with her hands. I saw my sister in the car with her face pressed against the window. I could see the Arabian running to the barn with the man flapping on her back. I saw my horse roll over, right herself, which actually relieved me because I was afraid she would be hurt, and run, slide down the, down the hill and run to the barn. And I could see in the barn. The barn door faced away from me. I shouldn't have been able to see in the barn, but I could see the commotion in the barn as all this was happening. And the one thing I thought, and I, I guess I said it or thought it aloud, because when you're dead, you're not really speaking, but your thoughts, you can hear your thoughts. Your thoughts are basically aloud. They're said aloud. And I said, I wish my sisters didn't have to see me die. That was my one regret. And when I said that, I saw a light over my shoulder. It was shining over my right shoulder. And I wondered how I hadn't seen it before, but it was this golden light. It was bathing everything 
everything in front of me. It was bathing everything in this golden light. It wasn't the sun. I knew it wasn't the sun. And I turned to look. So I turned to look over my right shoulder and there was a man up there with me. And I knew him. And he came closer until he was right next to me. And he had this big grin on his face. And I said, hi, I know you. And it was Jesus. Now, he didn't say, I always tell people there's, he's not like, I'm Jesus, hear me roar. He was just Jesus. It was just Jesus. I knew him immediately. Every soul, every cell in my soul, everything about me knew exactly who he was. I should not have the seen Jesus. Why should I see Jesus? I'm Jewish. My father told me Jesus was the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on mankind. That's what he told me constantly. And yet there was Jesus. And all I could think about was I knew him. I had known him my entire life. Mm. And I loved him. I loved him with everything in me. I didn't want to look away from his face. I, I mean, everything else became peripheral. All there was for me was Jesus and his Jesus face. That's it. That's all I cared about. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of, I don't have the right words to describe this. And I can't tell you everything because I can't remember every single thing we said. But all I know is he is funny. He is joy. He is love. He is everything good in the universe, in one person. Mm. He's everything that is good and joyous and happy and life-giving is in him. And he um, showed me a lot. I had a life review within his presence. He, he... And you saw your life. I did. Yeah. All at once. It wasn't like he... It wasn't like it went, you know... Frame by frame. Uh, step by step by step. It was all at once. And I was 16 and... You know, let's, let's, I was 16 and I knew about the Ten Commandments and other than lying to my parents to get out of the house, to sneak out of the house, I hadn't done any, I hadn't broken any of the Ten Commandments. I hadn't murdered anybody. I didn't covet anyone's goods. I was a nice kid, but I still had a life review and he could, it was like watching this tape of your life, except it was 3D and it was alive and you were re-experiencing everything you had done. And I saw him from the time I was in my mother's womb mm. for me. I saw him sitting next to me when I was an infant, talking to me. I saw him at every stage of my life. He was always there, which is kind of weird to be having Jesus right next to you, showing you your life and you're watching your life and you're watching your life and your life with Jesus. <laughs> right. And I realized when I had been praying and I had been talking to God when I was a little kid, I was talking to him. It was he who was sitting at the side of my bed, listening to me. So he did, there were a couple times he stopped the tape. Once we, he stopped the tape because there was a really funny scene and we were both cracking up about it. But there was another time he stopped the tape of my life to show me when I had hurt someone. Hmm. And um, it was so, to me, so unimportant at the time, but it was really important to him there was, my father was driving me to Hebrew school when I was 10 years old, and he'd picked up a 13 year old boy, take him as well. And I was very tall for my age, and this, this young man was really small for his age. And I just looked at him and sitting in the back seat of the car, and I said, Why are you so shrimpy? And that was such a mean thing to say, and I'm not generally a mean kid. And I felt his heart shrink in his chest. I felt the impact my words had on him. So everything I did or said to someone else, if it was a good thing, I felt that. If it was a not so good thing, I felt that. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to interject, but you know when they say the sticks and stones may break our bones, but names, names will never hurt me. They hurt so much. Names Those names hurt. hurts even more than sticks and stones, I'm telling you. They la and it la and the wounds last for, for a lifetime. Yes, absolutely. And that's what he was showing me. Mm. And I knew I didn't want to do that again. We'll be right back with part two of our podcast right after this.
Hello again, this is The Watchman. Please join us each week for an exciting and inspirational podcast dealing with angel encounters, heavenly visitations, near-death experiences, as well as modern-day prophecies that are relevant to us today. So tune in each week and share it with your friends. After all, they could use a little inspiration in their life, too. That's the Watchman on the Wall podcast, and now you can find us on YouTube. We return now with part two of our podcast, The Near-Death Experience of Heidi Barr. I, I really learned, I understood every little thing matters. He's, God is paying attention to every single little thing we do. Even though, though I was only 16 years old, I wasn't excused. After, this, after the life review, I was still dead. Believe me, I was not paying attention to anything happening below us because all I cared about was Jesus. He was the, he was the only real thing to me. Um, he took my hand and we left. And it, I always say it was like flying and it wasn't like flying. If you know that scene from the original Superman, Superman and Lois Lane when they're yep. flying. Okay, that's what we did, but we were surfing on a wave of light. It was, and he said, he said to me, this is so cool. And I was like, yeah, this is so cool. We are surfing on a wave of light and it's all colors underneath our feet. I did look down at our feet because I could feel it. He had bare feet, I had bare feet, so I know that. But, um, and I, I mean, we're, he's kind of wearing this robe. I know what he was wearing. I wasn't really paying attention to what I was wearing. But we were holding hands. I had my left arm stretched out. And we laughed and chatted and talked about everything as we're surfing. It was, it was the most incredible experience. You know, up until then, riding a horse, really galloping a horse across an open field was my heaven. Yeah. This was heaven. This was the most fun thing in the entire universe to do this with Jesus. And we were going faster and faster. And I like speed. We approached what I can only describe as a threshold. And you have to keep in mind, I'm trying to describe these things in English that, that are very difficult to describe. So a threshold is the only way I can, it's the only image I can come up with where we approached a threshold and we, we were going so fast that everything became one thing. Jesus and I were still separate and he was holding my hand. But I saw that, every, that everything became one thing, that one thing was God. He was in us, we were in him. God was everywhere. There was no place in this universe where there is not God, the Father, no place. And as we crossed that threshold, I was, there was a light. I was in a light. So I'll try to get this, describe this. And it's so hard. This was a perfect white blemishless light. And it took up my entire field of vision. It was infinite in its scope and it was alive. The light was love. And this was God. This was God. Jesus took me into that light. The next thing I knew, I found myself sitting on God's lap. Now, I cannot explain the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I can't. I'm not a theologian. All I know is that in my life, since this happened, I have known Jesus, I have known God, the Father, and I have heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All I can tell you, I can't. Don't ask me to give an explanation. I can't. But I found myself sitting on God's lap. And he is a big God. And I'm like a little toddler sitting on his lap, kicking my feet. And I have my arms around him. He's got his arms around me. I've got my face buried in his chest. And um, I couldn't see his face. I, I kind of tried and his face was obscured. I did not see it. All I can say is... I have never felt so loved, so cherished. God was every single molecule of love in the universe is God. Mm. He's, he's got love. Mm -hmm. And 
I could have sat there forever. If you would, I think if anyone would have asked me, would you like to sit on God's lap for all eternity? I would have said, yes, thank you. I'll just sit here for all eternity. That's where he wanted to be. But God wanted to show me something. And I, how God speaks, I don't know, but I knew he wanted to show me something. So you have this infinite God. The only way I can describe it is this. Picture an infinite-sized God wearing an infinite-sized white robe. The, the robe extends infinitely in all directions. It covers everything. There's nothing left but God. So I lifted my head and I looked in the direction he indicated I should look. And I, it's almost as if in order to show me this, he had to remove a portion of himself. He had to withdraw a portion of himself. And the first thing I saw, and you have to keep in mind, which I forgot to mention, I was very blind on earth. I used to have really thick glasses. I, I could barely, I could read like this. Mm. I, I since have since had LASIK. Yeah, I have to read like, uh, like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had to read like this. So I'm looking infinitely far away and I can see perfectly. The first thing I saw, which will stick with me until the day I die and after, was grass. It was this beautiful green grass. Every I could see every blade of this grass in this infinite sized meadow. Every single blade was so perfect and so precise. And the green was the green. It's like the green here, but it's the, the real green. The green here, all the colors here are a reflection of the colors there. Wow. So I'm looking at this real green. This is a living green. Mm. And I look a little bit farther and I see flowers. And, the, and these flowers, there was one particular patch of flowers that, that caught my eye and they look like irises. They were this beautiful blue purple. And um, I could see every part of the flower. I could see every vein in the petals. I could see every single part of the flower. And the, the colors, again, were, these are living colors. These aren't the colors. They're the, the same colors here, but they're living colors. They're the heart of colors. They're the essence of color. And I looked farther and I saw a grove upon grove of trees. Like, um, think about quaking aspen trees. I could see every tree, every branch, every leaf, and every vein and every leaf and every tree. And this is, we're talking an infinite number of trees here. And I could see every vein on every leaf on every tree. Mm. And I realized everything was moving, but it wasn't wind. The grass was singing. The grass was singing the praises of God. And the flowers and the trees were moving to the song of the grass. And it was, it was, it was God moving through all those things that brought life to them, that that they they moved in, in God's light. And I, I looked a little farther. I could see a path now and um, figures coming towards me, people. They were singing and their voices were beautiful, but I couldn't make out their faces. I couldn't see anything clearly. It was as if there was still a veil there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I couldn't tell. I just saw a number of people coming down this path. And suddenly Jesus was right there. And he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And I said, no, nope, I'm not going back. And I put my face back into God's chest. I said, I'm going back. And he pulled my hand and he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And really, this is hard to resist Jesus. You don't tell him no. You honestly do not tell him no when he says you're going to do something. And I said, I'm not going back. I'm, I'm not going back. And this time he said, you didn't die. You have to go back. And, and he just pulled me right off God's lap and God let me go. And I was screaming, no, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. I'll feel pain. I knew very well I was going to feel pain. And there was no surfing, there was no wave of light, just bam, right above my body. And he's there with me, and I and I see my body laying there, I was kind of laying on my side. 
And I saw Charlie, the ranch owner, next to me, kneeling next to me. He was crying and he was praying. And nobody had done anything. It was just quiet there. Nobody did CPR back then. And um, everyone, everything was silent. And I didn't know how I was going to get back in my body. But Jesus shoved me in. I was like, just kind of just shoved in from underneath, from behind. And I hit the inside of my face. You have to, what you have to picture is, your soul gets sucked back into your body and you hit the inside of your skull. And it's like coming up against a brick wall. And I panicked because I was so trapped in my body. My body was not moving. I was struggling inside my body. And suddenly Jesus is in there with me. And he smoothed my arms into my arms. He smoothed my legs into my legs. He made me whole again. And I mean, he, he talked to me the whole time he was doing this. I got a lot of messages from him. And after I was whole again, it took me a long time to figure out how to take a breath, how to open an eye, how to talk. And I remember finally taking a breath, oh, cracking open one eye and saying, Charlie. And he just said, thank God, thank God, threw me over my horse, which you don't do. No, you don't move up. Someone with potential spine and neck injuries, yeah. Yes. Rode me down to the car, threw me in the car, drove right past, put my sisters in the car, drove right past the hospital, carried me up to my bed, left me there. Um, I don't know what he told my mom, but she drove him back out to the ranch, and my parents left me there for 24 hours before they realized I couldn't walk. I was in shock. Um, my recovery was very lengthy, but um, it's a miracle. I recovered fully. I should not be able to walk. Um, wow. And it, But you know, the interesting thing is, and I told my sister right then, my little sister shared a room with me and she stayed with me after my mother left to take Charlie back. And I told her what had happened. I told her everything that had happened. That was as much talking as I could do. Um, so my recovery was quite lengthy, but I did recover completely. I did not even receive tr- the appropriate treatment. Wow. God is the one God healed me. Yeah. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is it never occurred to me. I wouldn't walk. I, all I could think about was Jesus. All I could think about for the first 24 hours was Jesus. All I could think about the whole time I was in the hospital was Jesus. I didn't even, it didn't, it never occurred to me. Oh, you're really injured here. You may never walk again. Never even entered my mind. And after, my parents didn't come to see me till the next second day I was in the hospital. And they walked in the room. I told them what had happened. My father turned pale as a ghost, didn't say a word, left the room. My mother said, oh, honey, we imagine lots of things when we're unconscious. I said, I wasn't unconscious. I was dead. And it was the most real thing that's ever happened to me. Mm. So this wasn't something I could talk about in my family. Right. And... Um, you know, I was in the hospital for a long time. I was recovering at home for a long time, but everything changed. You have to understand something about Jesus. He's not a nag. He doesn't say, don't use drugs. Don't drink. You know, don't hang out with those kids. He doesn't, he's not a nag. He didn't say that to me. But I knew exactly what he expected of me when I came back to life. No more drugs. No more hanging out with druggy kids. Focus on school. We're here for a reason. Mm -hmm. I love this life. I came back loving life. Mm -hmm. I came back filled with love for this world. Filled with love for the people of this world. And I was a loner before. I'm still kind of loner. I'm, yeah. If you leave me on my own, I will. that's what I will be. <laughs> but we are community. God puts us here to be in relationship. Mm-hmm. God puts us here to learn to love and care for our fellow human beings. Yeah, incredible. So I just want to say thank you for, for opening up and being so transparent and sharing your story here. So um, thank you so much, Heidi Barr, for being here. And, uh, You're welcome. Really appreciate you and uh, may, may God continue to bless you. Thank you.
Hello again, this is The Watchman. Please join us on our new video channel called Encounters from Beyond the Veil. It's the same exciting content as our audio podcast, but in a shorter, but yet a video format. Also, please subscribe so you won't miss any of our episodes. That's Encounters from Beyond the Veil, exclusively found on YouTube. Well, thanks again for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. Any comments or suggestions you may have, you can send to the Watchman on the Wall 2020 at gmail.com. We encourage you to subscribe so you'll always be notified of our future episodes. Well, thanks again, and we'll see you next time on the Watchman on the Wall podcast.